All right. So I was trying to think in the last session, which was really funny and substantive, about what the connection was between that one and this one. Um, and I decided that it was that the prime minister studied poetry, which I was surprised by. Um, so we're here to talk about the future of communication, a little bit about the past, too. Um, do you mind kind of giving us the background on how you all started. Um, my interaction with the company is to think of it kind of as like a very smart spell check, but it'd be helpful if you give us a primer. Yeah, absolutely, Alexandra, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people here have used Grammarly? Excellent, it looks like maybe 15 or 20 percent. So. Uh, for those who don't have the context, uh, we offer a communication assistant that's focused on English writing. Our goal is to have it available everywhere you write. Today, you can access it through our browser extensions. You can access it in Microsoft Office uh, through our No mobile application, uh, in addition to other interfaces. And the purpose of the product is to help users communicate what they mean and be understood. And as you may gather from our name, uh, we began life focused on the mechanics of writing, things like spelling and grammar. But as time went on, we were able to leverage the data that we have and the users that we built uh, to move into higher order points of writing feedback, things like clarity and effectiveness. And so today, the product helps people across all walks of life uh, with all different types of communication so that they can communicate clearly and effectively and achieve their goals. Uh, what are you seeing? Are you able? So you've been around for seven years. Um, I, are you able to notice any patterns in the way that people communicate, or changes in the way that people communicate in that time frame? Yeah, absolutely. And this actually gives me an opportunity to dig in a little bit to the founding story of Grammarly. So uh, I realize we're in Toronto today. Appreciate you hosting a company from Silicon Valley, uh, but we do have. Uh, Quite a few connections to Canada, starting with our founders. Um, our founding team were Ukrainian, uh, but they immigrated here and are now Canadian citizens. And um, you know, as we've built the company, we've been fortunate to develop an absolutely incredible team uh, that goes back to the very early days of the founders' work. They had originally built a company called My Dropbox, which uh, was a plagiarism detection product uh, that ended up being acquired by Blackboard. And through that experience, realized that people were plagiarism uh, were plagiarizing because communication was really difficult. And so they said, hey, wouldn't it be great to take this technology domain we operate in, natural language processing, and apply that to a much bigger problem, which is the problem of helping people communicate what they mean and be understood. And that was the genesis of Grammarly uh, over eight years ago now. As the uh, company has grown, uh, one of the things that's really set us apart is our focus uh, on our product and our users. And today, uh, that's very evident through the, uh, the size of our user base, which is now over 7 million daily actives, um, and the breadth and depth of feedback that we provide them. So the popular view is that we're all getting um, less intelligent as machines get smarter. Um, so have you, I mean, seven years is actually a, probably a long enough time to be able to um, see changes in language um, and also spelling. So are you noticing kind of, are, are you basically, is it a more, intervent, is it necessary to be more interventionist now than it was a few years ago? Any changes in the way that people are expressing themselves? Yeah, thanks, Alexander. So the product, part of its strength is that it learns through input from users, uh, both implicit and explicit input. So for instance, if someone accepts or rejects some feedback, uh, that goes into our algorithms and the algorithms consider that and update things appropriately. Uh, and then also just looking at what people are writing, including things like the vocabulary that they're using. And so uh, what's been interesting for us, uh, we started life as a product focused on academia. The very first version of Grammarly was called Essay Rater and was developed in partnership with English professors who had a very high bar around both the quality uh, of feedback and also ensuring that as, in this case, students use the product, uh, they would actually build their skills rather than uh, losing the ability to communicate effectively. And that's always been kind of a core element of the Grammarly product. Uh, as we've grown, we've been able to see the evolution of the usage of language uh, as we've expanded beyond students uh, to other use cases like professional and personal. Uh, communications. Today our two biggest uh, communication types would be email and social media. So changes in the way that people communicate or not yet? Yeah, so the changes in the way people communicate uh, we can see in the vocabulary. So for instance, uh, we're constantly updating our dictionaries to ensure that um, the lexicon we're using uh, is current. 
And if you were to look at the dictionaries that we have today versus the dictionaries we have even six or 12 months ago, you would see a lot of change there. Okay. Um, where did, so where does this go? So I'd like to take the conversation to the future, not the present. Um, what are you anticipating? I'm, I'm interested in the, how the product's going to evolve. I'm also interested in kind of how you see the needs of humans um, in communication evolving as well. If, we want, if you take this five or ten years from now to go back to Jay's kind of dial question. Sure, yeah. So let's take each one of those separately. Let's start with where human communication is going and then kind of where technology fits in. So uh, maybe helpful just to look at the past a little bit here. If you think about um, how we lived decades ago, hundreds of years ago for sure, we tended to live in smaller communities. Uh, we didn't travel as much, and that meant that we had much higher shared context with the people we communicated with. And as a result, while communication was still important, um, it was easier to communicate. Uh, today, we're fortunate to um, live in diverse communities, uh, have the opportunity to travel, have the opportunity to be exposed to all different types of personalities and ideas uh, through the Internet, as one example. And uh, while that provides many benefits, um, it also provides challenges when it comes to communication, understanding shared context, and being able to clearly and effectively communicate what we mean. And as we continue to go forward and technology and communication channels continue to evolve, it's reasonable to expect that, that will become more difficult, not less difficult. At the same time, if we look at natural language processing and uh, the field that we started life in at Grammarly, which is grammatical error correction, uh, you know, this goes back decades. And there's certainly been progress in that time, but the reality is um, there's a lot of progress left to go. And the reason for that is to really help people communicate, you need uh, many things, including an understanding of the intention of the writer or the speaker, uh, plus the context of all the parties involved in the communication. And historically, it's been very hard to access. And based on where we're at right now, uh, from a technology perspective, um, we're in a position where we actually have access to a lot of that information. And uh, what's allowed Grammarly to really excel in the prior years is the ability to take that context, take that intent information, uh, and actually help people craft very effective messages so that they can achieve their goals in ways that they couldn't before. And that goes way beyond things like spelling and grammar. To the point where today, uh, Grammarly is really a communication assistant. You can think of it almost as a power tool for your communication. And that hasn't existed in the past. Most uh, writing applications, most communication applications have either been focused on the pipelines of distribution um, or the formatting of a message. If you think about something like a word processor, Grammarly is really the first writing tool at scale uh, to help people with the content itself, the actual message articulating their thoughts in a way that will accomplish their goals rather than channel or format of that distribution. And so as we move forward in time, our vision for the future is a world where people have a personal communication assistant, uh, certainly in written form, uh, in the future likely in other modes as well, that enables them to more fully communicate what they mean, uh, to do that to many different types of people and to communicate with different people perhaps in different ways that recognize their backgrounds and their context and allow everybody to deliver their message uh, in a way that's effective and clear and allows them to accomplish their goals. It's interesting to talk about the future because when people think about it, text doesn't come up as often. It's usually voice, and all the large chat companies are doubling down on personal assistance where the interface is speech and voice. And I'm curious what role text plays in the future, in your view. Yeah, so what's interesting is if you look at kind of the proliferation of digital communications, certainly many of those are in modes other than written form. Uh, but the majority uh, continue to be in written form, and for a variety of reasons, I think it's reasonable to expect that uh, the volume of text being created, the volume of messages being created will continue to increase with time. Uh, there's also a lot of um, kind of convergence, if you think about things like speech to text, uh, you know, with communication modes uh, uh, going, be going back and forth, and that makes the, uh, the written mode uh, even more important as these overall volumes of communication increase. What's your biggest challenge right now? Technical challenge. Okay, yeah, I was going to say our biggest challenge is recruiting and hiring. <laughs> yeah, what's that um, But our, our biggest technical challenge comes down to uh, a point that I hinted at a little bit earlier. So, you know, what we're doing right now in the field of uh, grammatical error correction is really pushing the boundaries uh, of what's been done in the past. And the reason for that is uh, we have access to what is quite possibly the, large, the world's largest volume of actively checked text going through our system. So our users are using our application to improve the quality of the writing. That's their reason for using the application. 
and the application itself actually helps them improve their content. And so the quality of the text coming out of our application is incredibly high, and it's also very broad because we're cross-platform. And that allows us to uh, take the same algorithms, the same hardware, uh, and actually get really incredible results uh, to get back to our users so that we continually improve the product, as uh, was hinted at a little bit in the prior session. And um, sorry, can I just interrupt you for one second? Sure. So um, companies like Microsoft, Apple, have, and Google have enormous user bases and also have spell checking functions. How do you uh, how do you conclude that you have the largest user, user or the largest base of textual communication? Yeah. So the key word there was actively check text. So the largest base of actively check text. And the idea is that because people are actually using our application to check text, and because the application itself is designed to help them improve the quality of the text, the finished product coming out of the application is very, very high quality. And it's also very broad, right? We're, look, we're able to work with users wherever they're writing, uh, regardless of what company supports that platform. Got it. Sorry to interrupt. So you were, you, but you were talking about your challenge, biggest challenge. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, you know, we have all this data, and uh, that gives us a very unique opportunity to understand more information about intent and context, which are the two areas that allow us to really push forward uh, both the breadth and the depth of feedback that we provide and also the precision of feedback that we provide, which are the three areas that we focus on. And, uh, and that's uh, something that you know, we work closely on with academia, uh, perhaps with, with some of you gathered here today, uh, and something that we're very excited about. Uh, this is an area where um, certainly a lot of the advances in machine learning and deep learning in particular are very applicable. Uh, it's also an area where, in part, because of the lack of great data, historically there hasn't been as much progress and advancement as there have in other areas like uh, image recognition, for instance. And so we have a unique opportunity here uh, to work with our users and the broader community um, you know, to actually apply this in a way that helps people uh, fully communicate what they mean and, and do that in a way that allows them to be understood and achieve the, the goals that they have. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the business side, just because I think that you're uniquely positioned to both see the AI and where it's going and then also talk about building a business. So earlier this year, you raised $110 million. You went from bootstrapping, I think, to $110 million. Do you see any risk to raising so much money as a startup? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, so I was uh, actually an investor prior to Grammarly with a firm called General Catalyst, uh, who's our lead investor in this round, not coincidentally. And um, you know what I learned from that experience is that the right investor at the right time can be incredibly helpful, and the inverse is also true. And when I joined Grammarly, I was not a founder. I got there uh, about two years after the company was started. Um, you know, the founders had already built an incredible product uh, and a very nice business. And as we grew the company, we always wanted to put the product and our users first. And uh, we've continued with that over the years, and that's what's allowed us to build uh, an incredibly high-quality product and, at this point, a very large user base, and a, and a user base that relies on Grammarly essentially as a utility. They use it every day, multiple times per day, for many different facets of their lives. As a byproduct, because of the value that we're providing, we were able to capture some of that and build a nice business. Uh, it was never our number one priority. Uh, we always thought that if we build a great product, uh, eventually we'll be able to build a great business, and that's how we continue to run the, the company today. Uh, but we were at a unique point in time over the last year where, uh, given the growth of our user base and given the opportunities that we have, uh, you know, we needed to uh, recruit more quickly, and it's particularly in the Bay Area where that's uh, a challenge these days. We thought it would be helpful to have a great investor group behind us to raise the profile of the company, in addition to helping us at the board level, providing input on strategy, help with business development, you know, the other areas that uh, investors can, can really move the needle on. And we feel very fortunate to have the investor group that we do, uh, General Catalyst, IVP, Spark, uh, in addition to some others, you know, put in the $110 million, and that's really helped us accelerate, not just given the capital, uh, but given the additional help and the recognition that came with it. Okay. Um, because this is about the future of human communication, I'm going to end on something that's near and dear to my heart. So in conferences, people talk a lot, when they talk about job destru destruction or displacement because of AI, they always talk about radiologists and truck drivers. But journalists care a lot about writers and what's going to happen in the hands of AI. Um, how is, basically, uh, do you think that AI is going to in augment um, writing and journalism, um, or in the kind of medium 
term, um, is it going to hurt it because it's going to make people potentially lazier? Sure. Yeah. So like many technologies, it has the potential to do both. And in Grammarly's case, we're very much focused on the first, um, building a technology that augments people's ability to communicate effectively, to write effectively, uh, to write in a compelling way, uh, and to do that in a way that is understood by the person you know, receiving the communication. And uh, I think the future is very bright. You know, um, so much of our human experience uh, comes down to our ability to communicate. Um, but because many of us have communicated from an early point in our life, we've just come to accept the limitations of human communication. Uh, and that's a shame because it means that much of our communication doesn't really achieve what's possible. And so we go through life with lost problem-solving opportunities, lost creativity, perhaps unnecessary disputes. And the technology uh, that we're building here and the technology that you know, will be built in this industry has the opportunity to counteract that and provide people with a new power tool to help them fully communicate uh, what they mean. And that has huge promise uh, for us as individuals uh, and also for us collectively. So overall, I'm very optimistic about where uh, the industry is headed and certainly where, where Grammy is headed within the industry. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, all of you.